Um, so anyways, when you, when you look up the definition of worship, whether it's in a dictionary, on the internet, whatever you do, look up the definition. It, it, the first thing that comes up is it's a feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. You will also find a whole lot of other definitions that kind of fit in with that. Some and some don't fit in so well. The language of the Hebrew text that we're going to look at this morning, which is Psalm 96. Um, the, the Hebrew literally translated means to blow a kiss toward or to kiss toward. It also includes other things like paying homage, uh, buying down, etc., serving, all of these things. But it's interesting because we usually blow a kiss towards someone that we love and we adore, right? And that's what worship is supposed to be. It should always be done in reverence to the high, to the higher from the lesser. Okay, the the higher never worships the lesser. The lesser worships the higher. Um, it involves things like prostrating yourself, bowing down, um, and the, a number of other things that we can do physically. In Psalm ninety six, it speaks to the idea of congregational worship or community worship rather than individual worship. The call is for all peoples or all nations of people. It is interesting when you read 1 Chronicles 16, verses 7 to 36. Now, there's a few more verses there, but you will notice that the words of this psalm are taken directly from that passage of Scripture. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant has just been brought back to Jerusalem uh, First Chronicles 15, and now King David offers burnt offerings to the Lord before the tent that he had erected where that was over the Ark of the Covenant. And he sings this song of praise to God after blessing the people. It isn't the entire song, but it's, it's, this psalm is part of that song. In Psalm 96, David points out two specific things of utmost importance to us when, we, when it comes to worshiping God. There are many things and perhaps many people in this world that we can worship. People worship Hollywood stars. They worship their favorite sports hero. They worship money. They worship all kinds of material things. David points out here that the object of our worship should be God. He is the only one that is worth worshiping. He is the only thing that is worth worshiping. And he deserves our worship. So the object of our worship is very, very important. You could say it's a matter of life and death. The second thing of importance, David points out, is the reason for our worship being directed to God. I like it when, personally, when things make sense. You know, when, when two and two equals four, that's good with me. When they try to tell me it equals five or three, it doesn't, that doesn't work. Isaiah, I, I look at Isaiah the prophet, and he was probably kind of a guy like this. He talks to the people, and he says, think about this, people. You take a part of that tree you cut down, and you, you burn it to cook your food and everything and stay warm. And then he says, you take the other part of that tree and you carve yourselves idols out of it. Does that make sense? You burn half of it and the other half you make idols out of it. Things that cannot help you, that have no life. And you, you bow down and you worship those idols. Does that remind you of someone today, some people today sometimes? For sure. How can a piece of dead wood, this is what Isaiah is really saying, how can that piece of dead wood that you just burned, the same piece of wood, do anything for you? It has no life, and, and it can't do anything for itself. You're the one carrying it around, and, and you're worshiping that thing? That makes no sense. In fact, he says at one point, he says, there is no knowledge in the people anymore. There is no discernment. People aren't thinking. They aren't reasoning through things anymore. And I think we can relate to that today, can't we? Therefore, we have to consider carefully the object of our worship and the reason for our worship. 
And so this morning, I want us to walk through this psalm as we consider God as the object of our worship and consider the reasons why we worship him. David says, sing a new song unto the Lord. Some people think that having something new, something different all the time is good. That's not what David's talking about here. Because Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. So we're not going to surprise God with anything new. But he says, sing a new song. And what he's really saying is he's saying, sing a refreshed song of praise to the Lord. So you and I, when we gather as a church, there are people that say, man, we need the new songs. The old ones are are boring and they they don't they just don't they don't get me anymore and all of this stuff and um, and I look at them and I say consider this you sang that song for how many years and it had a zeal in it for you right yeah but but it's just it's lost that no the hymn hasn't lost it who's lost the zeal the heart of the person's lost the zeal is what's going on. And we've got to place that in the right place. So David says, your heart's going to get that way once in a while. He said, sing a refreshed song to the Lord. Um, and, and so, because God is praiseworthy, and it's exciting, and it's encouraging, and it, to sing out and to shout out about the marvelous works of God. Do you, do you consider the works that God has done? I mean, this God created everything we see and know. This God created you and I. That little baby, God created. Those little ones, God created them. And they are such a blessing. He created everything. He is a forgiving God. He's a God that sustains us. He saves us. He restores us. He loves us and is merciful towards us. His marvelous works need to be considered. That should make us want to sing out in praise to him who has blessed us with the great salvation and brought us back into the arms of his family. He deserves our worship. David says, for he is great and greatly to be praised, to be feared above all gods. The, the word great here in the Hebrew sets the living God of heaven so far apart from those other gods of the world that they can't even come close. He is so much greater. He is everything that they are not. He is the giver of life. They themselves don't have life. He is the father of eternity. They waste away to nothing. Nothing in any way, shape, or form can come close to co in comparison to the God of heaven. Nothing. He is supreme over everything. So much mightier, so much more holy, so much more righteous, so much more pure and moral and, and spiritual. He is everything that we should desire to be. We ought to praise him for that. That's a good reason to praise him. If you dare to compare the gods of this world to him, you will see the inadequacy of these gods and their abilities to do anything, to give you anything, to help you with anything. In fact, you're the one that has to help them around even when you move around. Think about it. How foolish is that? So God is praiseworthy. Look at all of the things he's done for us. He deserves our praise. His splendor, his majesty, his strength, and his beauty. The psalmist praises God, or he says to praise God for this. And he talks about those things. It's interesting. He says, in his sanctuary. And sometimes when, when the translator translates things, they will take, and so if the Hebrew says, literally, in his holy place, they will say sanctuary in that stead. And so the real wording here is, in his holiness or in his holy place. The first, first the psalmist speaks to the divine character of God as being holy, and then he speaks to, to God as being, um, God being holy in every way that he does things. 
He is holy. And so David wants the people to understand the significance of the Ark of the Covenant being there back in Jerusalem. He is celebrating the fact that the living, or the place where God lived amongst his people was with them again. The splendor of God, the majesty of God, his strength, his beauty was all right there in front of them in that Ark of the Covenant. And he wanted them to know that. These attributes of God are seen in his holiness, in his holy dwelling place. And so for you and I, it's in heaven. And we'll get to that. But in that Ark of the Covenant, God sat on the mercy seat with the wings of the cherubim over top of him. So when we see Jesus, when we see God in all their glory, think about the wonderful sight it will be to behold. Think about that. It will be so much more majestic and glorious than we can even imagine with our physical minds that we have. So in the first six verses of the psalm, David encourages the people to sing praises to God, refreshed praises to God, because of his greatness, because of his beauty and majesty, his strength and his splendor. He is the one who is worthy of our worship and praise. He is the life of us. He is the life of men. He created us, not like those empty vessels they called idols that were void of life themselves. But God is also holy. The ESV translation in Psalm 96, 7 and 8 says, ascribe to the Lord. And probably most of us understand what that means. But ascribe means to credit the Lord or give credit to the Lord or assign to the Lord. And of course, the simplest form would be give to the Lord. So whatever he's talking about giving, he says he wants you to give it to the Lord or credit the Lord for it. The exhortation to families is telling them that worship or, or accrediting things to God um, isn't only an individual thing, it is a corporate thing, it's a family thing who are united by the strong ties of blood. Now that's family. So think about this. You and I, as the church, are tied together, we are united by the blood of Christ. We're united together as his family. And so as his family, we should be lifting up worship and praise to him as a community of people. That's what David's saying. If, our, if the family want, is, is joyous, we should be joyous. If the family is struggling, we should be mourning and, your, and enduring adversity together. It's something that a family does. But in all of that, we are worshiping God. Remember that. We are worshiping him. And so David encourages us here in our worship of God to give credit to God for his strength and his glory. Think about this. Without his strength and his glory, would the church exist? It wouldn't exist. It only exists because of him. Romans 15, Paul prays for the church to live in harmony. And in, verse 50, in chapter 15, verse 6, he says that together, so that together you may with one voice glorify God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Hebrews had a great number of names for God. Did you, do you know that? God was, depending on their situation, they used a different name for God. So each name was descriptive of a characteristic or an attribute of God. Now, El, El, was the most common name for God. But there were a whole lot of other ones, like Elohim, uh, Yahweh, Adonai. And, and I, I didn't even realize how many names they had for God. But they would take El, which is God, and they would attach it to another word to make a name. And so they would say El Shaddai, and that meant God Almighty. So everybody knew exactly what you were saying about God when you called him by his name. So every time they said El Shaddai, everybody knew that you were talking about God Almighty. So something about his might. Okay? And, and they did that with a lot of different names. David says here 
that you and I are called to worship God and give credit to his name, all that is due him. It takes on a different meaning when you all of a sudden understand what he means to glorify his name. That means in whatever situation you are in, he's God. He's God even if you're suffering. He's the God of salvation. He's the almighty God. He's Lord God. He's all of these things. And we have to attribute all of that to him or credit him with all of those things. So that's why we are supposed to glorify his name. So part of our worship is offerings to God. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, By the mercies of God, we should present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. That is our spiritual worship. Think about that. As you're doing stuff through the week, do you realize that what you're doing is worshiping something? And we want to make sure it's worshiping God and not something else. And we need to be cognizant of that. Everything we do in this world is a worship to something or someone. And we want our worship to always be of God. To glorify him, glorify his name. We want our, our, our sacrifices to come up as a sweet aroma before him, a pleasing worship to him. And in turn, he is glorified. His name is glorified in all the world. And then in verse 9, David makes it really clear that we cannot wholeheartedly and honorably worship God without complete humility and reverence. Have you ever thought about that? Worship him, David tells us, in the splendor of his holiness. Not how holy we are, not how good we are, not anything about who I am, but worship him in his holiness, in his holy place. The splendor of holiness is found in his sanctuary. So think about this as Christians today. Hebrews Chapter 4 and verse 16 says, Jesus is our high priest, and because of our high priest, we can draw near to the throne of grace that is in the sanctuary, not built with hands, but the sanctuary that God has built in heaven. You and I enter his throne room through Christ, worshiping him. How amazing is that? We also need to understand the awesomeness of God and that we in all creation should tremble before him, David says, because he is to be feared and revered. That is where humility on our part comes in. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 30 deals with some ungodly things that man can fall into. And in verse 31, he concludes the passage saying, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, that doesn't have to scare you. That doesn't have to uh, put you in dismay. Those things are mentioned to show us that doing those things can get us there, but we don't have to be doing those things. This helps us to see and to understand the importance of humility and reverence before God. So first, we worship God because he is worthy of every bit of praise that we can muster. And secondly, we worship God because he is holy, he is righteous, he is the eternal splendor and majesty in heaven that deserves our humble and reverent worship. And then there's still a couple more things that he brings out here in the psalm. Psalm 96, verse 10, he says that among the nations... The Lord reigns. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read the word reign, the first thing that jumps into my mind is he's king. Right? But David says, this has been established and will not be moved, or it will not be changed. And then he says he's going to judge the world with equity and righteousness. But when you hear that word, you, you think right away, okay, God is king. 
You need to understand how the Israelites would have looked at this. In Israel, the king would go down to the gate at certain times and he would sit. They had a place for him to sit, probably quite fancy because he was the king. But he would sit at the gate and the people could come to the gate before the king and lay their cases out before him or their struggles they're having or whatever it was. And the king would give them a verdict. He says, God is king. Okay, so um, we, need to, we need to understand that he is king and that his verdict is the verdict that's going to stand. You see, he's king of kings. He is king of all those kings that sat in those gates and king of any king on this, in this world. He is king over them. So how much more weight does his authority carry? In Revelation 15 is the scene of seven, the seven angels with the seven plates. And the, saint, the saints that have gone before are there with them. And they sing the song of Moses. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just, just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? We are doing, sorry, that, that's, the, that's the passage in Revelation 15. And that is what we're doing here this morning. We are worshiping God. We are trying to glorify his name the best we can. Because we want him to be glorified because he truly deserves our worship. Now there are quite a number of times in scripture where the writer will use the, an inanimate object of this world to show just how deserving God is of worship or other things. Jesus himself said in Luke chapter nine, 19 and verse 10, when he's entering Jerusalem triumphantly and his, his apostles and his disciples are singing and they're saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And, and the Pharisees are there and they're looking at Jesus and they're distraught because they don't believe that. And so they're distraught. And they, they look at Jesus and they say, rebuke your disciples already. And Jesus looks at them and he says, I tell you, if these all were silent, the very stones would cry out. <clears throat> Have you ever heard a stone cry out? He's making an emphasis. He's making a point. You're not going to shut up. You're not going to shut up the people for God. You're not going to shut God up, period. David in this psalm says a similar thing. He says, let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. The sea roar and the fields exult. The trees and the forest sing before the Lord comes. You know, that kind of puts things in perspective. It's going to be an exuberant reunion for those who worship the Lord. But David wants those who aren't worshiping the Lord to understand if an inanimate object would worship God, what does that make you if you choose not to worship God? <laughs> not, very, not very bright, right? That, that, that's what David's trying to get across. And so the final reason we should choose to worship God is that he comes to judge the earth. He's the judge. You know, the king, when he sat in the gate, he was the judge. God is the judge. Of everyone. Many scriptures speak of God's judgment to come. The Hebrews 9 and 27 says it is appointed for man to die once and then the judgment. And Jesus talked in his ministry a lot about judgment. More than anybody in this world that I know now wants to ever talk about it. Most people want to avoid it, the subject. But Jesus talked a lot about it. Matthew 25 is where Jesus talks about the final judgment and the nations are gathered before him. And there are some on the right and some on the left and they're separated. And he says to the ones on the right, he says, come, you blessed of the father and inherit the kingdom. And then he looks over to the left and he says, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
Let me ask you, is that, is that good enough to make you want to worship God? To desire to worship God? It is for me. One of the scariest passages is where Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. Only those who do the will of the Father. We've got to have humility. We've got to have reverence for God. And we need to listen to God. We need to have faith in him and obedience to him. So there's no doubt in the fact that God is king of all nations. And that he deserves every ounce of worship that we can probably possibly get. But he is also the judge who is going to ultimately face you in that day. What will Jesus represent for you when you stand before the Father? Will it be enter in or will it be depart from me? That's a choice we all have to make. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios this morning, illustrations maybe. Um, uh, And it's important to understand that each one of us has to make that individual choice ourselves. I cannot make the choice for you. You cannot make the choice for me. I have to make it for me. You have to make it for you. That's the way it works. That's the only way it works. And so these illustrations will maybe help you to put things in perspective. President Clinton named Christine Gebby, a lesbian, as the new AIDS czar when he was in office. Four months later, she spelled out her perceptions on traditional morality. She said, the U.S. needs to review human sexuality as an essentially important and pleasurable thing. Until it does, until it does so, we will continue to be repressed Victorian, a, a repressed Victorian society that misrepresents information, denies homosexuality, particularly in teens, and leaves people abandoned with no place to go. Aren't we bad? That's what she's trying to say. When we're in Christ, we're bad people. I can help you just a little bit, she says, in my job. Standing on the White House lawn, talking about sex with no lightning bolts falling on my head. That sounds like a deer, doesn't it? I'll tell you what. I would suggest that you don't stand anywhere close to her. Because she just chooses not to worship God. On the other hand, there are some pioneers who are making their way across one of the central states in the, in the early 1800s to a distant place where they had been promised that they could homestead and, and make, take some land for themselves. So they traveled in covered wagons drawn by oxen, and that process was really slow. One day, they were horrified to notice a long line of smoke in the west stretching for miles, which was right before them, across the prairie. And soon it was evident that it was a dry grass fire burning fiercely and coming towards them. And it was moving fast. They had crossed a river just a day or two before, but they knew that they wouldn't make it back to the river before the fire would overtake them. One man seemed to understand their situation better than the rest. And so he said, people, set fire to that grass behind us because it was going away from them. And he said, get that fire going. And they did. And it burned a sufficient area in size to hold them all and and keep them a distance from the fire coming. And... um, As the flames came roaring toward them, a little girl cried out in horror. She said, are you sure we will not all be burned up? And this man said, we will not be burned up. My child, he said, we are already on what's burned and the fire is done. We're standing where it has been burned already. So it is with those who choose to worship God. Those who are safe in the the arms of Christ. The fires of Haiti will not consume them. And that's what God's promise is to us. So we have to make a choice. Which one sounds better? Going with God or with the person that doesn't worship God? 
You can choose to worship God and inherit the kingdom. And well, the other one, well, you know what it is, and I don't think I have to mention, but if you want to make that choice today to, to um, choose God and to, to be in his camp and to worship him, we encourage you to do that. We want you to do that. We want you to join us in his in worship of him. So let us know how we can serve you while we stand and sing. Um.